All my life, I wanted to interview Glenn Kenny, uh, the author of the new book about the making of Goodfellas, Made Men, which has just come out uh, this month and is already doing very well in the uh, Amazon bestsellers and all, all the rest of it. So it's a, it's a fantastic book. I'm really delighted to have Glenn with us today. Uh, 30 years ago, Goodfellas was released. I saw it, Glenn, in uh, a small northern English town, Ulverston, birthplace of Stan Laurel. Uh, I was a young guy. Uh, I would have been about 18. And I was knocked out. Where did you see the film and what was your immediate reaction? I saw the film at a multiplex on Broadway around uh, Union Square, around the corner from the office of my, uh, of my uh, magazine I worked for called Video Review. Uh, less than a year before, I had met with Martin Scorsese in his office, uh, having him uh, do an As Told To essay for that magazine. And he was in the middle of editing Goodfellas. And he was very excited about the film. And I'd been a Scorsese follower and fan for a long time, and I was naturally excited to see whatever he'd come out with. But in the case of having spoken to him while he was editing this movie, which he said, even if it comes in at two and a half hours, it's going to be one of the most fast-paced movies ever made. I was like, well, this sounds interesting, because his movies always were pretty grab you by the neck in terms of your attention span. So the week it came out uh, in September of 1990, I went after work to see it by myself. Uh, and uh, aside from the emotional and, uh, you know, just general artistic impact of the whole thing, I came out of it saying, boy, he wasn't kidding about that movie being fast paced because it just, the two hours and 25 minutes or so just whizzed by. It was a real head rush, which was, I think, the intention. Absolutely. I mean, there were a lot of uh, gangster films that were coming out between The Godfather and Goodfellas. And, and some of them, you know, very critically lauded. But Goodfellas had real staying power. And, and today we, we mention it in the same breath as Godfather. If not, I mean, I find it difficult to choose a favorite. It's the Rolling Stones and the Beatles of gangster movies for me. Um, why do you think it has such staying power? Because it's an incredibly dynamic movie. Scorsese is one of those directors who manages to put life on the frame in every, uh, in every frame he shoots. And it's not necessarily realistic life. His movies often use a very heightened realism that draws its effects from even Italian horror movies of the 60s. In the opening scene where they're uh, killing Billy Bats for the second time and the three figures are bathed in this hellish red light from the uh, rear lights of the car, you know, that's not realistic. It wouldn't, it, you know, bathe the entire body in, in that red light. That's from a Mario Bava movie, but it, heightens the emotion. And so from the very beginning, you get this heightened emotion of it. Then there's the speed of it. And then there's the paradox of your being charmed by these charismatic, uh, confident guys who are morally and uh, socially repellent. So there's a, lot there's a lot going on that makes it uh, interesting. And you know, it's different from The Godfather. You don't really have to choose between the two because they're about different things. I think the, the storyline of The Godfather is about Don Vito Corleone being exactly where he wants in the early 40s, having built up his crime and olive oil empire, and then seeing it all fall apart and trying to maintain order. Whereas Goodfellas is just about anarchy from start to finish. It's about what these guys can get away with. It's about what Henry Hill says at the end in the trial scene. He says, everything was for the taking. So the question is, what's it like to live in a world where everything is for the taking? Absol yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I mean, you have some performances there from Joe Pesci, De Niro, obviously, and Ray Yotta was sort of, was, he'd been in some films, but he was kind of unknown. He was a real breakout of the, of the movie. He knew he could do the part. And if you'd seen uh, Jonathan Demme's Something Wild, where he right. plays the ex-boyfriend of Melanie Griffith, and he has this very cocky demeanor that then degenerates into an almost lunatic sadism, you knew that he had those uh, qualities in his toolbox. The skeptic at the time was the producer, Erwin Winkler, who Liotta uh, eventually saw dining at, with his lovely wife, Margot Winkler, at a Santa Monica restaurant and actually was so uh, excited for the part that he and knew that Erwin was kind of the holdout that he asked Erwin to come outside and speak to him for 10 minutes. And when I interviewed producer Erwin Winkler, he said, yes, he had that conversation with Ray Liotta 
he didn't tell me what the substance of the conversation was, but he said, yes, 10 minutes later, he said, you're right for the part. Excellent, an excellent choice. And uh, I've read the book, um, your book, obviously, but I've also read Wise Guy by Nicholas Pileggi. And I think the language that uh, comes from the book and that comes from the voiceover in the film, it seems to infect your, your, uh, your book as well. Um, were you sort of consciously influenced by the sort of wise guy tone of voice? Well, I am Italian American, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, despite my last name, my my father's Irish and my mother's people are from Naples. And uh, you know, at, at certain funerals years ago, you would see some uh, some uh, unusually well dressed uh, relatives in the back coming in. So I don't know. I'm not a criminal myself, but certainly. Uh, I write, uh, I wrote this book in a conversational style. And, uh, you know, just as uh, Henry Hill's storytelling style is, is very conversational and vivid, you know, and I think Nick Pileggi is one of the great writers in America. I wish he'd write more books uh, because both his book Casino and the book Wise Guy are terrific. And what he does, people underestimate how hard it is to do what he does because within that book Wise Guy, he doesn't just have the voices of Henry Hill, he has the voice of Karen Hill, Henry Hill's girlfriend, and all these different voices come across very distinctly and very vividly. And that's not just transcription, because transcription is ums and ahs and oohs and elisions and uh, falling into, you know, conversation. To be able to, to edit it in such a way that it's true to Henry's voice, but it also has, lives up to the standards of prose is a very challenging thing, and he does that. And... Uh, writing in a conversational style, you know, I don't, uh, I, I, I didn't want to create a book that was uh, academic or uh, jargony. So, uh, you know, I've, I've developed a conversational style of writing since I was a rock, uh, a rock critic. I began as a rock critic and I read the, the American magazine Cream. And a lot of those writers who influenced me, Robert Chris Gow, Lester Bangs, James Wolcott was writing for them at the time. They all have this conversational style they'll drop little humorous asides or, you know, potentially or, uh, you know, ambitiously humorous. And uh, so that's where my style comes from. And uh, not so much a tough guy style, but very much a conversational style. Right. Very vivid. Um, I mean, you must have spent so long with this one movie. What, what, what do you think your, your next project will be? Are you going to look at Casino or would you want to go and do something totally different now? I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to my editor about a number of different projects. And uh, unless I'm specifically asked to do something, I don't think my next project will be Scorsese contingent. I have a proposal for a history of the, uh, you know, rebuilding or reconstruction or reinvention of New York's Times Square that I'd like to have my uh, editor look at. I also have a... Uh, I'd like to do a book about uh, what's going on in film now, how, um, you know, uh, the, the way of looking at films in terms of their social content is, is shaking things up in terms of the canon and how we can create a canon that has, um, you know, representation that's uh, fair and, and uh, that, that, that doesn't slight the work of filmmaker of color, filmmakers of color and women filmmakers, but can also maintain uh, at least a, a toehold on what we recognize as the, uh, what some recognize as the canon now, that would be an ambitious project as well. So those are two things I'm gonna run past my editor who has uh, first refusal on my next project. Right, brilliant. Okay, well, we really look forward to that. And uh, let me just uh, close by saying, uh, this comes highly recommended, a wonderful detailed account of uh, the making uh, of Goodfellas, uh, loads and loads of stories that, that uh, any fan of the film will love. And the most important thing, it makes me want to go back and watch the film again, which, uh, which I probably do tonight. Um, so thanks so much for your time, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Always thanks. good speaking to you. Thank Great. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.